We've, we've very lucky. We've got two months of Adar this year. How cool is that? How cool is that? Because it's a leap year, so it's Adar Rishon. And it's Adar Shani this year. And according, it's very interesting what Adar Shani is. And for those who are into the, into the zodiac signs, Adar is Pisces. So actually someone who's born in Adar Shani, it's a discussion amongst the Kabbalists what star sign you are. Some say you're Pisces, but some say you're above the star signs. You're in a, in a place where the evil eye can't, can't touch you. So it's very auspicious times, but I definitely believe, especially because Purim is actually in the second month of Adar. So we do have absolutely two months of sheer bliss and happiness and lots of drink. One of the most important laws in, in the whole of the Code of Jewish Law is a very interesting law. It says, It's incumbent upon us to drink until you don't know the difference between Homon, between Homon is cursed and Mordechai is blessed. And some people take that on and think that's a mitzvah every day. It's actually really only a mitzvah on Purim to get to that level of, of drinking. And we're gonna speak about it a bit later. We're gonna to connect tonight's topic to the reason why we need to get so intoxicated. You've no idea if you're, as we say, coming or going. Special um, big up to Verda, who's actually listening in from Turkey tonight. In 11.35, I'm jealous of your spiritual reward you're going to get for, for learning Torah at 11.34 at night. And we haven't even started yet, so you're hardcore. And, and it says, Lefum Sara Agra, according to the effort is the reward. So you're going to spiritually get a huge reward. And welcome to our new crews from Rotherham who are joining us. To Asher and Michal. And a beautiful baby Hadassah. So, and, and they're a bit hidden there, but you, can, you want to put your baby back on, onto the screen. If anybody, by the way, is, is hidden, as much as people like to think you're God, you're not God, you, you're allowed to reveal yourself this evening and, and you don't, don't be shy behind the black screen, right? Definitely um, show yourself so it's easier for me to um, relate to you, to talk to you, to understand who I'm chatting with. Um, I've given Layla permission not to have the screen on, fair enough, and Lani. Nice to see you, Le Layla and Lani, and I'm looking forward to seeing you both in London super soon. And a huge thank you to Anton for arranging it. Nice to see you, Anton. All, all well? You good? Unfortunately, um, it doesn't look like our transfer night is going to plan again because we're Spurs, but at least we can learn Torah. So at least we can have the world to come. We're not going to have this world, but at least we can have the world to come, Anton, for, for, for me and Anton share our um, dislike for Tottenham Hotspur especially this evening. Anyway, much more important things. So Anton and I, an amazing organization, by the way, nice to see you, Sivan. What's up, Sivan? All the way in Richmond, nice to see you. You've got a holy name, you know that, Sivan. Like, it's like so cool, like you could be called Nissan or Adar, right? you've got Sivan, like super holy, super holy. It means unity and it means friendship and it means terrorist. It's the month the terror was given, so you've got a holy name. Anyway, me and Anton actually know each other from years, 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 years back about 31 years ago, 31 years ago, I think, we met in, in Israel, in Yavne, when I was in Yeshiva, and he was in a kibbutz, and we started learning Torah together then, and then we picked things up about seven and a half years ago, and we had an idea to come up with a seven-year course for his amazing organization called HOD, the Hebrew Order of David, which does incredible acts of kindness around the world, actually. It's, 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 a, it's a global organization. And we spoke about the idea of they, they very much embody the notion of kindness. We said, have you ever learned the Torah behind the kindness? What's the education aspect to HOD like? And Anton is like, I'm up for it, let's do it. And we came up with a very ambitious 49 class talk spanning over seven years. So those who are joining us tonight are now joining us in the seventh year, in the seventh year, but don't worry each, you don't have to um, go back to understand the first 42 talks to understand tonight. Relax, it's all good because they're all standalone talks. But at the same time, we're building a picture. We're building a picture connected to something called the 49 Spirot. There's seven Spirot, there's seven, actually 10 channels that God made the world via these spiritual channels. If you wanna go online now, you can quickly check it out. The Spirot, the first three, by the way, I apologize for my voice. Hashem has decided just to take it away as soon as I was sleeping tonight. What can we do? Let's hope it's not COVID. <clears throat> So um, the top three spirot, Chachma bin Adat, and that's where the word Chabad comes from. That's referring to the spiritual secrets of, of 
intelligence. In other words, when you have an idea, you have that flash of inspiration, that's Chofmah. Bina is then you start absorbing that information. It's your emotional connection. And Das is the harmony between that flash of inspiration and the internalization. So whenever you have an idea, which you put into practice, you're going through this. So again, I'm trying to uh, admit someone in the room. We're going through the practice of Chochmah Bina Das. Every time you hatch an idea, which really falls into your head from Hashem, and then you think about it, and then you bring it out. That's the top three, which is called the crown, which is really above us. What we're really more focused in is the seven lowest spirit, which anybody knows about the spirit Omer, the counting of the Omer, those 49 days between Passover and Shavuot. When we came out of Egypt to receive the Torah, we needed to go through what's called 49 steps. 49 steps. So those 49 steps is what we've been learning through this program. And it starts off with Chesed, with love and kindness, which is Abraham. It goes, if you've got the... Again, if you've got the opportunity to go online, quickly look up what the spirit look like. And you can see the channels. And then it's on the right is Chochmah. On the left, it's called Gvura, which is called Justice, which is Isaac. In the middle is Teferis, which is Balance and Harmony. To the right, lower down now, really where the kidneys are, is Netzach and Hod, Moses and Aaron. And then Yesod is Joseph. And finally, we're starting the year together of Malchut, of kingship which is a connection to Mashiach. Mashiach is always Malchut, which is King David. And as we learn through, through this course over the next, please God, what we're going to do from tonight, once a month on a Monday night, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, we'll learn during those, please God, seven months, we'll go through our course over these seven months. So stay with us once, once a month on a Monday night, please do. And we're going to work our way to Mashiach and and let's hope, and how cool would it be, Anton? How cool would it be if on our night, where we're talking about Mashiach, and we hit the 49 steps, actually Mashiach comes that night. How cool is that? That would be like pretty good timing. So you never know. Let, 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 let's hope for that. And we're going to learn about resurrection of the dead and Mashiach. That's near the end. But to start off with, we're going to go to a topic which I think people don't understand the power of. And I would say Kabbalistically, it's one of the most important Kabbalistic energies that there is out there. And there's a great fallacy because a lot of people in religion think to be religious, to be observant is about following ritual. It's about following observance, about being meticulous to the law. And we miss the whole point because the point of Judaism, the point of Torah, the point of life, the point of humanity is about what I call falling in love with Hashem. God's in love with you. Hashem would love it if we could be reactive and reciprocate their love and, and be in a loving relationship. And what's problematic is sometimes people who get into religion are doing it because of guilt. They're doing it because they believe in a higher power and they don't want to get punished in the next world. So they're like, oh my gosh, I better like sort my life out before it's too late. But that's okay if you want to do it that way. At least you're connecting. At least you might do some good things. But it's way better, my friends. It's way better. It's way, way, way better to do it out of love. Now, I want to start off with a dilemma, the Kabbalistic dilemma, which over the next two sessions, because tonight we're going to talk about love, and which is Abraham. Abraham was called Ahuvi, my loved one. Abraham was called my loved one by Hashem. Hashem, the epitome of Hashem's love to us was the way Hashem loved, loved Abraham. And the way the we're meant to love God is the way that Abraham loved Hashem. And he brought love to all humanity. He taught the world love and he embodied this notion of love. That's what we're going to start off with love tonight. But what's really interesting is in spirituality. Are you meant to start off with love or are you meant to start off with what we call gira? Which we're going to cram translate today, not as fear, but as respect. As respect. Do we start off with gira or ava? And it's actually a big contradiction in, in, in Kabbalah. It's a famous line from Proverbs, which is racist chokma yiras Hashem. The first step of wisdom is actually fear of God. But yet, we start off with Abraham, who embodies love. And I want to share with you why I'm starting off with love. I absolutely believe more than anything in today's generation, as, as the Beatles used to sing, all you need is love. We need love more than, more than ever. More than ever. That's what's missing. 
and it's missing from religion, it's missing from marriages, it's missing from families, it's missing from humanity. Look at the House of Commons today, not a lot of love, right? And, and there's not a lot of love out there. And amazingly, sometimes even in religion, there's not a lot of love. And when I try and help someone connect back to Judaism, I believe the first step needs to be love. I'll tell you why, because if it's fear and guilt and trembling, that can become almost, almost an abusive relationship. And I, we're going to make this comparison tonight between you and Hashem and, and you and your loved one, you and your spouse, you and your soulmate, or, or you and your parents. We have this fascinating analogy. But on one hand, God is like a parent. Also, he's like a soulmate. It's a chatan and kala under the chupah, but also like a parent to a child. So these are the two great mashalim, the great parables we need to think about. So on one hand, let's do the soulmate relationship first. Imagine if you're getting married because you're so scared of the one, one another. You're so scared that you're going to let the other person down. You're so scared, maybe literally frightened of the other. If you say the wrong thing, you know, there was a terrible case yesterday in the papers where this girlfriend of one of the footballers is coming out with blood and beaten up and injured. And now the footballer has been taken by the police. That's the... That's the, that's how toxic a abusive relationship can be. So that's why I believe the first step should not be fear. We have to understand what King Solomon meant. We can explain that in session two by Rashi's Chokma, Yeras Hashem. But I believe we need to start off with love. And it's, by the way, the same thing with the parents. If, you're, if your relationship to your parents is primarily out of duty and out of fear, a bit of a shame. It's a shame. And God forbid it could lead almost to a very unhealthy relationship at times. Where's the love? There needs to be love. So let's start off with understanding that Judaism and Torah, and let's just talk about us and God. Hashem is looking for love. So the question is, how do you fall in love with God? Because if you think about it, have you seen God? We can't see Hashem. As I said to you, those hiding behind the, the, the screens, or being godly, Hashem hides, Hashem hides. You've never seen God. So you've never seen God. How can you fall in love with something you've never seen? If you've never spoken to God, we're going to learn about talking to God soon. Problem is, if you've heard God speak to you, you've probably got to see a psychiatrist because that's a bit problematic if you're actually hearing God back. So we're not meant to hear God back literally the way I'm speaking to you. We can hear God back in other ways, other messaging. But so if we can't see God and we can't hear God, how the heck are you meant to fall in love with God? How are you meant to do that? So tonight I'm going to give you, I believe, three beautiful Kabbalistic steps of how to fall in love with God. I want to start off with one of my favorite books in the world. If that's okay with you. I want to first of all define, according to the holy Kabbalist, the Ramchal, or Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the great mystic from Italy, born in 1707 wrote many masterpieces, one including Path of the Just, Mesilati Sharim. So he writes in chapter 19 a little bit about falling in love with God. So let's just hear his definition, and that can just begin tonight. Okay, this is what he says. If you want to check it out, if you've got your Mesilati Sharim, it's, it's chapter 19, page 130. He says, let's define it. What does it mean to love Hashem? Sheyeya Odom, that a person truly longs for and craves the nearest for Hashem to pursue his holiness. As one pursues something that he strongly desires. So when is the last time you craved for something? How many people crave, you know, as I said, I'm a rabbi who's a coke addict. Sorry, everybody, that's my weakness, right? Not the, the coke with the nose, but the coke in the red can. And, and here's the thing, I do crave it. I'm sorry, like if it's gone like 20 hours, 22 hours, my body starts shaking. And I'm like getting palpitations and there's literally a physical craving for my for sugar, for Coca-Cola. People crave all sorts of things. So we know what it means to physically crave. I've got news for you, my friends. Listen to this. You have a soul. The real you is your soul, not your body. Your body is your mask. Your body is your clothes. Your body isn't you. You're not taking your body with you. You know, someone asked me a question after last night's talk. You know, for those who know, don't know, we do a class every Sunday night and at the moment now Tuesday nights. So those of you who it's the first, you're always welcome to join on this Zoom 
Sunday, Monday, and some, generally Sunday and Tuesday. So on last night's talk, someone asked me a question. What do you think to this? You can message back in. They asked me, their mother has said that when she dies, she wants the son to promise her and write in a contract that she will be cremated. She wants to be cremated. She doesn't want to be buried. The last thing she wants to do is be buried. She wants to be cremated. And he asked me, what do, what do I do? That's a good question, no? On one hand, you've got to honor your parents. On the other hand, one of the greatest sins we can possibly do is to destroy the body because as we're going to learn about, there's something called the resurrection of the dead. And, and that resurrection of the dead comes from a bone at the back of the body called the Luz bone, somewhere in the, in, in the spine. There's a bone which the Talmud writes and doctors have confirmed this is indestructible. And, and we're resurrected back from that bone. And I, I told him what the halakha is in that case, that oh, you only have to honor your parents when it's within the framework of goodness, of spirituality. When you're doing something which is the opposite of what God wants, there is zero obligation to honor them. And really what the mom's soul will absolutely want, the moment the mother leaves this world, is anything but cremation. As soon as the mother passes away and passes to the other side, passes to, to, to the world of spiritual reality, the last thing, that that mother would want is to be cremated. She'd be like, please don't cremate me. So then you are honoring your parents by doing what the soul wants. Why? And this is the point. Because you're not your body, you're your soul. You need to understand that. You're not your body, you're your soul. The problem is that, as I said, God is hidden. The soul is hidden. So most people think, I'm my body. But in spirituality, you're your soul. And here's the point. When you start realizing, it, accessing that, you can start listening to it. Just like you can hear your body craving for something, you feel the cravings of the body. We have the power, we have the possibility, all of you can achieve it. And you probably have achieved it at times in your life. There's the craving of the soul. Do you know what I, my soul craves for every single day? To be in Israel. It's craving every single day to be by the Western Wall. It's called the Ga'aguim. The soul just wants to be one with Hashem. By the way, that's where even the notion of homesickness from. People are homesick. Why are people homesick when they're, when they're away from a home they didn't even really like? You know, that they moan at a therapist for 20 years about how they're unhappy about their home, yet they dream of the home and they're homesick of their home. The reason is it cleans their result because it's really a reflection of how the soul is homesick to be one with God. Before you were born, we were in the spiritual world and we were with Hashem. And then Hashem told an angel to appoint which soul comes into this world. And then we were brought into this world. And now we're distant and we're kind of far away. And we're now in a long distance relationship. But the soul is yearning to be one with Hashem. And at least it's yearning to be in Israel, in Eretz Yisrael. It's, it's yearning to be by the Western Wall. I yearn to be in Spas. I yearn to be by the grave of the Ariza. And you can now add Rabbi Nachman's grave. There's something so holy about Rabbi Nachman's grave that I yearn to be there too. So that's like my Neshama's yearning. So you will all have soul yearnings. And once you realize, and once you can start hearing the inclinations and the cravings of your soul, you can start having a soul to God relationship. And, and what I really hope you can start achieving is what the Ramchal says here, that you should be have cravings for God. That means if you haven't learned maybe all day some Torah, you should feel, I need to learn a bit. It's a bit like if you haven't eaten all day, you're feeling all wheezy and you're feeling like a little bit shaky. If your soul feels that, people who go to the mikvah a lot will feel that if they haven't been to the mikvah for a while. People who generally put on tefillin will feel very weird if they haven't put on spilling. Like the more you, you accustom yourself to certain mitzvot, your soul finds nourishment in it. And then if you stop nourishing the soul, the soul is like, no, what are you doing? Come back. In fact, I'll tell you something very deep. That Ariza says that a lot of depression out there in, in the world, a lot of people who are depressed, it's actually the soul that's feeling undernourished. Your neshama is feeling, listen to me. You're like locking me up. 
the way I like to make an analogy, it's like most people put their soul, they put a sock in it and they stuff it in the boot of the car and that's it. And the soul's like kicking, like, hello, is anybody out there? Can't you hear me? And we're like, we're having too much fun on Netflix and, and being distracted by physicality. And before we know it, we don't even realize there is a soul, God forbid. So that's the fight between the soul yearning, calling, calling, hello, I'm here, I'm here. And then the Yitzhahara trying to silence the soul. It's like the soul, the Yitzhahara is trying to put the soul on mute. And the, the higher inclination is trying to put the volume up. Now, one of the ways you put the volume up is through talks like this, it's through learning Torah, it's through mitzvot, it's through awareness, it's through some of the steps we're going to speak about. But the goal, says the Ramchal, is to start craving Hashem. How amazing if you could achieve that, right? To crave Hashem. And then he says, the mere mention of Hashem's name, the uttering of his praises, with the words of Hashem's Torah, with his divine nature, will bring one true delight and enjoyment of, in the manner of one who deeply loves the wife he married in his youth, or his only son, whereby even just referring to them bring him pleasure and enjoyment. And he brings the verse from Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, chapter 31, verse 19, in Hebrew, Ki midi dabri boy, oid. for when I speak about him, I will remember him enjoying, enjoying me. Just to say Baruch Hashem, just to, to say a verse. You know, there's a guy in the synagogue who prays next to me. He's unbelievable. Every day when he prays. He never loses his excitement for prayer. He never loses his passion. When he just recites the morning psalms and he's just singing the praises, he's doing it with such devotion and with a loud voice. And it's amazing. He just like makes me feel like, okay, wake up. I need to get, I need to get into it. Focus, focus, focus. Because he's so on it. Because his soul is so tuned in and so connected exactly like the words that the Ramchal is saying. And then he, then he goes on. Says Lutzato, surely someone who truly loves Hashem will never forego the eternal service for any reason whatsoever. And he will need other encouragement. In other words, when you love Hashem so much, you just want to do what he wants. There's no even option. That's really the goal. I'll teach you something very deep. The Ram, the Rabbi Desler writes, Desler writes that the goal is to get to a place where you no longer have free will. Tomorrow night, please God, with the legend. The amazing mystic Rabbi Dr. Akiva Tatz, who will be doing an amazing session about how we have free will if Hashem knows the future. But Rabbi Desler goes on to say the goal is almost to lose free will. What do I mean? Think about it. Let's say, what's a good example? You come home and your partner wants to go and say uh, he had a bad day and he just wants to go and, and just give verbal abuse about his boss, let's say, or about his friends, and say what we call Lashon Ara, to say evil speech, which by the way, just like it's forbidden what goes in our mouth, there's certain laws about what comes out of our mouth, and one of those laws is called Lashon Ara, we're not allowed to say evil gossip about people, and the Chofetz Chaim writes that we can, God forbid, transgress up to 31 of the 613 commandments every time we speak e evil speech. So, What's interesting is if you come home and then if your partner starts to say evil speech, it should be immediate. You say, no, 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 please don't. You should almost like be shocked. It's almost like someone's trying torturing you. And you should literally feel in pain at the thought of hearing Lashon Hara right now. You know, I always say, I don't remember, I don't recall in my 48 years that I knew my dad, but he, him once speaking Lashon Hara, never heard it. Never heard it. Never heard once. Because it was like, why would you? Why? What's, what's to be gained from it? And it, it's, it's so vulgar. And there's so no, it's, it's so unnecessary and so painful. But when you get accustomed not to speak Lush and horror, you almost feel the physical pulling away. And you almost repulsed. You feel that being repulsed. It's like if I give you some food, which is, which is off, which, is, which smells terribly. That's how we need to get into that habit. When you really love Hashem, an opportunity to sin comes, you're like, mm -mm, as we say, God forbid. Like, totally uninterested. Last thing I would ever want to dream of doing. That's the goal. That's when you know you're really in love with God. Just like in a scenario when a couple are really in love with each other, they wouldn't dream of having an affair. They wouldn't dream on cheating 
on each other. Similarly, when you're really in love with God, you wouldn't dream on cheating with Hashem, which is a very interesting analogy because we're taught that idolatry replicates adultery. When we serve adult, when we serve idolatry, in a sense, we are having cheating on God. And you might say, okay, I'm not interested in idols, but hello, how many of you love money? Will do anything to get money. Rav Moshe Feinstein says money is today's idolatry. How many people are obsessed with pop stars or this or that, where that becomes like an idol culture? So we do, there was even a show used to be called Pop Idol, right? So we do have idols today, where at times that could be looked at as cheating on God. If we have to start looking at when there's something we know that God doesn't want us to do, it's in the Torah, it says don't do it. If we start looking at that, we're cheating on God every time we do that. Maybe that might help us not do that. That's what the Ramchal is saying here. That's what he says. Let me give you a few other beautiful verses. One of my favorite verses in Tehillim, King David, chapter 42, verse 2 and 3. Savan, you'll like this one. Mm-hmm. King David says, as a deer cries longingly for the brooks of water, so, my, so too my soul yearns for you, Hashem. My soul thirsts for Hashem. That's oh, another classic one. Somalachanafshi. My soul is thirsting for you. We need to get into that mentality that we can start feeling that our soul is craving, thirsting. That's the when, that's the goal, that's the utopia. That's when we're in love with God. But tonight I'm going to give you three steps, three pieces of advice how, how to fall in love with God. Advice number one comes from. One of the Sadiqim that I learned a lot from was Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, the big Sadiq Rabbi Nachman. If you go to Lukute Maharan in Torah Nun Base 52, he writes the following. He says, You can't fall in love with Hashem unless you have what's called his bodadut, or in Hebrew, hit bodadut. Anyone know what his bodadut is? <coughs> this is what it is. Spending time talking to God. Now, first of all, let's give the analogy. And we said there's always going to be three parables. Man, wife, child, parent, and us and Hashem. Let's say four falling in love for a start. You want to have a beautiful love. You want to be in love. What do we say is the most important thing? Always communication. Pivotal communication. If you don't have healthy communication, it's not going to work out, is it? It's, it's just not going to be good. And therefore, and the better the communication. There was an amazing book that Hashem helped me find, which was called 10 Minutes to Save a Ben Marriage. And in that book, 10 Minutes to Save a Marriage, it talks about Rabbi Winkler, Gershon Winkler. He writes that if only we could speak to each other for 10 minutes a day. But in those 10 minutes, what he recommends is one day, let the woman talk. And the man shouldn't say a word, just listen for 10 minutes. And he wants to butt in, you know, how many times when we have discussions, count. Now, now you know it. Next time you have a chat with your loved one, start counting how many seconds before you be butt in. Just it could be like 10 seconds, five seconds, maybe to a really good 30 seconds. This book trains you for 10 minutes just to listen. And then it's an amazing concept because then you learn to really hear. And you do learn, and then the next day you can reply. So if anyone ever has, let's say, issues in their relationship, I really recommend this method. It's unbelievable. 10 minutes, one person talks. The next day, someone replies. 10 minutes, and it goes, and you learn how to listen. You learn how to communicate. I always tell my couples, learn every day you need to have a time where you speak to each other, and you should book it in in the morning. When are we having dinner together? When are we talking today? The moment you stop doing that, you start having resentment feeling up. They start feeling disconnection. And still, God forbid, one can still, one can start going apart from each other. My dear friends, the same thing with us and Hashem. Again, you might think of me, I'm crazy. You're like, are you meant to be talking to God? Absolutely. Rabbi Nachman said, this is hardcore, and I'm not expecting you to do this. Rabbi Nachman says, guess how many minutes a day you're meant to talk to God? Can you guess? You can put a chat on Zoom. Put it on a chat. Have a guess. How many minutes do you think Rabbi Nachman says you're meant to talk to God? Have a guess. Have a guess. So he says, more than eight minutes later, keep going up, higher. 
Anyone else? More than 30, Cyril? That's hardcore, Sivan. He says 60. He says 60. He needs an hour now. Again, I don't, we're not on that level. But a lot of Breslov Hasidim, they go out to the forest or go out to a, to a park or out where no one's around. And they have a chat with God. And they talk to Hashem. And now... You obviously can do it in your mind, otherwise people might arrest you, but it, it is important to feel you can have dialogue. Now, I'm going to let you into how Rabbi Hill does it, how Rabbi Hill does it, how I do it, which, I, which is kind of my take on it. This is what I do, and I really recommend you do this at, at the very least, which is when you pray, which is quite ironic because people don't realize praying is also talking to God. But what I'm talking about is talking in your language. So let's, for example, I've got a dilemma at the moment i'm not going to share that with you but there's a dilemma and and i really don't know to do a or b let's just call it to go down the a so i literally i'm just talking to hashem about it every day say hashem i need your help i don't know what to do help me give me a sign should i do this or should it and i explain to hashem why i'm upset and i explain to hashem the dilemma and i explain to hashem the pros and cons and we chat and and that builds my fosters my relationship all of a sudden, I feel Hashem's in my life because it's, it's the opposite. We said at the beginning, how can you love Hashem? You don't see Hashem. You can't speak to Hashem. You can spiritually see Hashem, as we're going to see soon. And we can definitely speak to Hashem whenever you want, whenever you want. I'll speak to Hashem sometimes. Sometimes I'm in traffic and I'm a little bit late. I'll say, Hashem, can you like do something with the traffic lights, please? Can you like sort the traffic up lights out? And by the way, often he does. You know, I've had, I've had the most amazing exposure experiences just in the car when I had a very important meeting. And, and, and because I prayed earlier and I didn't want to miss that minyan. So I said, Hashem, I'm going to pray in this minyan, but you can't like make me late. And, and I need to be able to like get to my meeting on time. Otherwise, it won't end well. And, and obviously, Hashem said yes, because I'm now on my way. All of a sudden, literally, it's like free of stuff. All the, the, it's green, 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 green. All the traffic lights on green, green, green. All of a sudden, the middle of the day in Hampstead, there's no cars on the road. And then, guess this, literally, I'm thinking, where on earth am I going to park? Because it's in the middle of Hampstead, and there's no parking. And I am um, unbelievably just outside his office, just as I'm getting there, a car pulls off, which leaves a nice space for Rabbi Hill's car right in front. Says Hashem, thank you so much. Very nice of you. And I put my car there, and I got there on time. And that's the way it should be, my friends. That's the way it should be. I'm telling you, Hashem plays with traffic lights. That's a little, little, little game from Hashem. Some like when you're not on a good form and Hashem needs to like put that red light up, all of a sudden you're seeing red lights everywhere. It's unbelievable. And by the way, on those days, like the red lights are broken, like you're stuck on red, like for ages. And you go and you're anyway, and it's like, should be like, I think I'm probably going in the wrong direction in life, right? And it's meant to wake you up. And then sometimes it's like the green, so everything's green. And that's really sometimes the flow, like if you're in business, sometimes there's like this green light. There's just a flow of energy. Everything's happening. The right investors are coming in, the right donors are, it's just this beautiful flow. That's like the green light flow. And then sometimes nothing works. It's like these walls in front. That's, you start understanding Hashem talks to us as well. Of course he does. It's just not like this. As I said, if anybody feels you've heard God literally speak to you, please speak to me later because we need help. There's like some fantastic doctors and psychiatrists it can help you. So I don't want you hearing voices. What I do want you hearing is hearing the messages. As, as the Kedusha Slave, the Rebbe Yitzchuk of says, everything's love messages between Hashem and us. He's constantly sending us love notes, love letters through life. Even now, very much now, because obviously it's about that. But there's going to be something specific that Hashem put in my mind to say to you, which is exactly what you, wouldn't, what you were looking to hear. It's exactly what you needed. Because Hashem is cool that way. He's just able to give you exactly what you need on the minute that you need it. Not a minute before, not a minute after. All connected to the energy, connected to your Hebrew name, connected to the month. You're going to see, my friends, there's going to be a shift in your life this month. Because we're now entering Adar. And there's going to be a shift, for sure. Different, it's going to shift. Please God for the better. And please God, it's in the month of happiness. And, and there'll, there'll be Hashem will reveal himself more. Adar in Kabbalah means Aleph Dar. Hashem dwells with you. Like we say in Hebrew, Lador, Diga, is to, to live. So, so Adar means Aleph, which is God. Dar is living with you. You start seeing that he's your flatmate. 
you know, he's, 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 he's sharing your house with you. You start feeling the presence of the Shekhinah much more during this month and you'll feel, so Rabbi Nachman talks about the importance of what's called his spoidus. And he says, every day we should talk, talk to Hashem. And if you have a dilemma, talk it out with God. It's funny, people say, I need to talk to someone. Try and like talk to God. Just go to the garden, have a chat with Hashem. You know, go. I think you should go out. Rabbi Nachman talks about going out to a place, ideally really where it's totally, there's no one, no, no human around. Best, best as possible, if you can. And by the way, he does like the idea of going at night as well. Obviously, don't do anything dangerous. But if there's some places you can go in at night, which isn't dangerous, then that's even a more beautiful time to do his spoiledus. And he talks about trying to do it for even for an hour. That's by hardcore. Oh, so I was saying, this is when I do it, my friends. When I pray, at the end of my prayer, when I, you know the Amida, the most important part of prayer, the 18 pressings of the Amida. My friends, if you don't know this, this is going to change your life. You ready? This will change your life forever for the better. You're going to love this. It's worth coming to hear this. When you finish the Amida, which one of the problems when you say the Amida is if you're especially not fluent in Hebrew, you're almost like saying it almost like a parrot. And yes, it is achieving things because you're saying Hebrew words, which are opening up spiritual channels. The most powerful channel you can open up is your heart. And what I do at the end of my Amidah every day, three times a day, I just talk to God. That's when I do my spoke of this. And, and someone told me once, TSP. TSP, thank you, sorry, please. First of all, I say thank you. We're going to learn that in a minute. Every day I count my blessing for something. I'll say thank you for something. Then I say sorry for something. Unfortunately, there's a big list normally, but I'll focus on something. Because even to the word sorry, like Boris Johnson said the word sorry like a couple of times a day, didn't believe a word of it. And, and he didn't specify what he's sorry about. We should specify to Hashem what we're sorry about. We should say sorry for that. You should make your relationship real. As we said, you want to be in love, you've got to have a healthy communication. So the more you verbalize it, you're more open about that communication, the better. So let's be specific about what you're sorry about. And then the request. And first, please. So thank you, sorry, please. And then the first, please, it should be for other people. Like today, my friend told me, this person's got cancer, this other person's got cancer. So straight away in my mind, I'm praying for them first. You pray for other people before you. And you should try and get the names of people you know who are sick. And you pray for them or people, by the way, if there's like something missing in your life, something you're really struggling with, before you pray for yourself, find someone else in your shoes and pray for them first. Very important principle. So someone who prays for someone else gets answered first. It's really important to be selfless in our prayers and to be sharing in our prayers. So then you pray for them first. And then you can pray and you should absolutely pray for yourself. And it's interesting when people say to me, Rabbi Hill, I really need this. I really want this. I, I like, have you prayed for it? If you haven't prayed for it, don't complain you haven't got it. It's like, you know, you need some money and the money's in the bank account. If you haven't taken it out of the bank, how do you expect to get it's not going to magically appear on your, in, in your wallet, right? You need to go and withdraw it. The way we withdraw our blessings and salvations is prayer, is his spoiledness, is communication. You need to ask like a child who wants something from its parents, needs to ask. What's amazing about a newborn, the mother knows exactly what the newborn needs, even the cry that the newborn does. So sometimes, even if we cry a certain way, Hashem can know, but because Hashem wants us to enact our free will, and this is the point, really Hashem can give it to us straight away. We could just <laughs> make a little cry and that'll be enough. But Hashem wants us, for our sake, to build up that rapport, to build up that relationship, to fall in love with Hashem. And therefore, sometimes that's why he withdraws. And that's why he wants to make you say it and beg for it almost. Say, Hashem, I need your help. And you can shout if you want. And like, ah, help me. You can do that. Maybe not in Brent Cross, not in public, right? But do it in, in, in a place of privacy and go for it and shout and cry and be real, be open. And that's my friends called his spokedness. It's life-changing. It connects to the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, <clears throat> which is called Haneo Balailo, someone who stays awake at night. And walks on his own. Does nothing else. Because when you do his bodhidus, you can't have, you can't be on your phone. You can't be thinking of business. You can't be thinking of other things. You've got to be, that's why, I don't know how they do it for 60 minutes. That's hardcore to do it for 60 minutes, other than prayer. That's awesome. 
That's why they're very holy. But at least if you start five minutes doing this photo, have five minutes where you're not thinking of anything else, and then the Mishnah concludes, <laughs> then you're connected to the divine. If you want to be connected to Hashem, if you want to be in love with Hashem, talk to Hashem. Talk to Hashem in privacy. Talk to Hashem when it's quiet. Talk to Hashem opening up your heart. And that is going to be one method to fall in love with Hashem. So method number one is called Dispodidus. Method number two, gratitude. Gratitude. What's the name of the Jewish people? What are we called? Yehudim. We're going to, in this Purim, we said La Yehudim, La Yehudim, Ha Isaira. We called La Yehudim. You know what the word La Yehudim, the Jewish people, comes from? Hoda'ah, thanks. A whole fabric or DNA is to be able to say thank you. By the way, people that don't say thank you, the ones I'm very into, anyone who's got little kids, you know, we, I, I saw Ashley Michal, you've got this beautiful baby Hadassah. Teach her to say thank you. Sivan, your two girls, teach them to say thank you. Like, almost take it away. Offer them something. They don't say thank you. Say, what's, what's the magic word? And you're not doing it because you need thank you. You're doing it for them. And this is the point. When you train a child to say thank you, you're training them to be a receptacle of God. You're, cha- you're training them to be a vessel that can receive the divine light. Because to be a Yehudi, to be Jewish, we need to be able to say thank you. That's what Judaism means. It means thank you. Thank you, thank you. You're now in a place where you're saying thank you. Who doesn't say thank you? Egotistical people, arrogant people, vain people, people who are self-entitled. Why do I have to thank you? You've got to really thank me. How lucky you are to be in my presence. So that's the vain people. But when you're humble, when you're in a place where, of course, you thank you, you, you you're so overwhelmed when someone does you a favor. That's what we need to learn to be. And that's what the word Yehudi means. And my dear friends, I believe one of the greatest ways to receive blessings in your life, one of the greatest ways to fall in love with God is to write a journal of gratitude so some people do journaling and i really recommend it and if you incorporate like a journaling gratitude it's amazing meaning whenever something good happens quickly write it down thank you for that thank, even easy even so-called silly things you know your dishwasher gets fixed and by the way you don't even realize like it's so easy for the dishwasher to break i mean for me one of my things i'm saying thank you every day if my teeth are not in pain it's thank you now, you might say, you're a Muppet rabbi, you drink Coke. What do you expect? Fair enough. But at the end of the day, I have issues with my teeth at times, and I'm so blessed. I'm not in, not in pain, thank you. And I learned this actually when I got really sick, when I got very ill with ME years back. Up until that time, I never appreciated health. The moment your health is taken away, oh my, oh my, oh my, you start appreciating health. And here's the thing. We shouldn't have to to learn the lesson the hard way. We need to learn it the easy way. God forbid Hashem has to take one's wealth away to start appreciating the blessing of wealth. God forbid Hashem has to take one's relationship away to appreciate the blessing of the relationship. Rabbi Desta says the best way to prevent ordeals, to prevent challenges is gratitude, to say thank you. And I've seen it so many times. If you're in a place where you're innately, automatically, in a zone of gratitude, saying thank you to Hashem, not just in three prayers a day, honestly, every hour, every hour, there should, there should be thoughts of gratitude. There should be, my gosh, thank you so much for that. Thank you. You know, a little business deal happens. Thank you. A little, anything. If you're enjoying tonight's talk, you should have gratitude to Hashem that he's put you in a, in a, an opportunity. You know, we were saying to Ashley and Michal that they found us because we put an advert in, in everywhere K. And I don't even know what came over me because we haven't put an advert there for a long time. But something came into my mind. Let's put an advert in everywhere K this week for tonight's talks. Maybe it's for you, Ashley Michal and Adasa, so you can hear tonight's talks. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So that's what happened because Hashem loves you and Hashem wanted you. So obviously, here's some of this information. So he puts thoughts into different people's heads to get the result that's needed to give you blessings. When we start realizing how much Hashem does for us, there's so much to say thank you for. So much. As I said, we, I lost one of my students last week who, who died out of, she was so ill for so many years. She had diabetes. She, she had two quick kidney transplants. She was blind for 20 years. And this girl, Louise White, she taught me how to say every day, 
with such kavana. Thank you, Hashem, that I can see. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech haolam pokeach ivrim. How many of us really can say it with kavana, with real devotion, thank you so much for giving sight to the blind. Those morning blessings could be life-changing if you said them in, in a place of genuinity and really understood it's for you. And I really feel so grateful. Oh my gosh, I'm alive this morning. I can breathe. You know, we've seen with COVID. One person with COVID, tragically, they passed away. Another one is a little cold. We should be so grateful if we've got COVID and we're okay. And oh, why should I have been? You know, people are so self-entitled. <laughs> you know, but you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, overweight and I'm not, don't have immune problems, blah, blah, blah. Are you joking? People who are very young, people super fit, then died with COVID. So everything is a blessing. And, and if you've been blessed, the least you can do is say, Toda, thank you. Just to say thank you, we need to learn to say thank you. There's amazing stories about that. I'll just give you one quick story. True story, a guy called Mr. Hirsch from Rehobot, speaking about eyes. He had a problem with his eyes. He had this eye, eye affliction. After many failed treatments, it became clear the only person who could help him was, was this doctor, this surgeon in the United States, and he was in Israel, and it was a lot of money. But he traveled with hope, and he sits at, finally he gets in front of this famous doctor, and the doctor says, I'm sorry to break this to you, but one eye is damaged beyond repair. And the other one's going to follow suit. There's nothing I can do. So utterly crushed, Mr. Hirsch, he walked out of the hospital, he found the nearest shul. He walked inside, put his head against the Arana Kodesh, the R. And he began to pour his heart out to his grades, like Rabbi Nachman says. He started doing his photo this. The moment you open up your heart to God, things change. Straight away, a thought came into his head of something he learned. From a rabbi called Rabbeinu Bachai, one of the great commentators on Kamash, he remembered he learned this, and it said the following, ja Yaakov Avinu was about to confront his brother Esau, who hated him passionately, he was approaching with 400 men. Yaakov desperately beseeched Hashem, and he began the words, Katonti Mikol Hasavim. You know the song from Yonatan Razel? Listen to it. Katonti Mikol Hasavim. It's a beautiful song. I really recommend. Right? He says, I'm undeserving of the kindness you've done for me until now. So Jacob doesn't start his prayer. It's like, God, help me out. My brother's trying to kill me. It's amazing. He's like, it's in a pain of acute trauma. And yet at that moment, he says, thank you so much, Hashem, for all you've done for me. That's the beginning of his prayer. That's how we, that's what we said, TSP, prayer. Let prayer begin with thank yous. So Rabbi Nochai advises, this is the way for anyone to pray when you need a big salvation. And he says, he quotes King David. King David says in Tehillim, chapter 16 verse 2 where he says i have no claim to your benefit king david says i have no claim to your benefit i don't i don't deserve it i really want you start off with when you need things truth is i don't deserve it totally i don't deserve it i shouldn't even be asking you i know i'm undeserved like i shouldn't even even i'm so lucky even to have this conversation with you but nonetheless then you can ask right then you can still ask for it but we have to start off with saying i don't deserve it so he starts remembering this. And then Mr. Hirsch broke down. He said, Hashem, I ask forgiveness for you. For 50 years, I enjoyed the wonderful gift of eyes with eyesight. And I never said thank you. Instead of Mr. Hirsch being angry and crying and saying, how dare you do this to me? He starts crying out of forgiveness that he never said thank you. I can't believe I never, I took my eyes for granted. And he starts to proceed to enumerate the countless gifts Hashem had given to him. And he expresses heartfelt appreciation for each, each one of them. After three hours of intense thanksgiving, he said one more statement. He said, Hashem, I want to thank you so much for the many more years of healthy eyesight that you're going to give me. That's Jewish chutzpah, right? That's Jewish chutzpah. He's throwing a little bit of chutzpah, right? You, 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 lots of thank you. And then we can be chutzpah. They can say thank you for the salvation. My friends, it works. You've got to try it. Say thank you for the salvation. Say thank you. I know it's going to work out. And he came out with positivity. Somehow he knew it's going to work out. The next day, he requested the doctor to do one more examination before he goes back to Israel. The specialist said, Listen, you're wasting your money. I don't mind. You want to pay to see me again. You're lost. I don't mind. Fine, come again. Anyway, he came again. 
And I don't know if any of you have ever had this at, at, at the doctor. The doctor starts going through the notes. And he's like, hmm, hmm. He's pouring through the notes. And then the doctor said this classic word that doctors hate to say, but they say it the whole time. I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind. I think we should do an operation. It's worth the gamble. Let's do it. Obviously, Mr. Hirsch didn't say a word. The operation took place without delay. And a few days later, he flew back home with two healthy eyes. Two healthy eyes. True story. His eyes were fine. And that's why we know about the story, because he wrote about it. And he told everyone about it. And I super, super recommend, my friends, that we do that. And it really works. You say thank you. And then you say even thank you for the salvation. So that's the second method, I believe. Second step of falling in love with God. First one we said was, anyone remember? What was step number one? But I had a bit of drink of orange juice. What was the first step? Write it down. What was the first step? His spider does. Time, not just prayer. Ashley McCall, nice to see you're still there. Right? Not just prayer, but actually, his spider does means private seclusion where it's just you and God. Like having a dating God, having a night out. I always say to my couples, you need to date Married couples need to date each other once a week. You need to have a date night. So Spodilus is date, private, seclusionary chat with Hashem. Ideally in a place where no one can hear. Like, like, as I said, he would go to a forest. Go, you know, I sometimes I just go for a walk around the block and have a chat with God around the block. So if you ever see, see me in Hendon, right, I'm having a chat with God. Don't just that. Of course you can just that. But um, Hashem doesn't mind. Here's the thing. So that's number two. So number one was Spodilus. Now... Number two is gratitude. And then finally, number three, here we go. Unconditional love. How do we achieve unconditional love? And how do we connect it to Purim? You know, um, Shani mentioned to me at the beginning, I hope you're going to talk about Adar and you hope you're going to talk about Purim. So Rabbi Hill wants to um, always connect to the energy of the time. So let's try and, and, and help you connect to that. So what does it mean you're meant to drink on Purim day? <sighs> to the extent where you no longer know the difference between Aru Haman and Baruch Mordechai, but you get so schmuzzled, you get so wasted, you get so out of it, you don't even know your name. Really, what's the point of that? Surely that's just like an excuse for being invited to work for Boris Johnson, right? Well, well what, is, what, what, what is the point of that? So, so it goes like this. According to Kabbalah, Yada is a problem. Sometimes in spirituality, our brain, which is a beautiful gift, could become an impediment when we start rationalizing things too much. Over-rationalization, let's call it. Anyone ever suffer from over-analysis, over-rationalization, only doing things which makes total sense? My friends, love doesn't make total sense. When you're really in love, you've got to do things for each other which makes zero sense. I can assure you there's things my wife asked me to do and, and she says she needs it. I'm like, I do not understand it. And I've been married like nearly 30 years. Makes zero sense to me. But you want it, so no problem. But like I said, that's where the love comes in. Same thing between us and Hashem. And I'll give you a few examples. Number one example, there's a Talmud. In Brachot, page 10a. In the Talmud in Brachot, page 10a, is the following story. And the story's dear to me. Because it's about a king called Chizkiyahu. Chizkiyahu the king. Was very sick, very, very ill, and he's on his deathbed. And the Talmud writes that a prophet called Yeshaya ben Amat, one of the greatest prophets, comes in to see Chizkiyahu and says, Chizkiyahu, I've got news, I've got a message from God. Now, by the way, please don't do this next time you visit the sick. Like, don't ever do this. This is what the prophet did. He came to visit Chizkiyahu and said, Chizkiyahu, message from Hashem, you're going to die and you're not going to live. So you're dead in this world and the next world, you're done. And it was all over. Chizkiyahu said, that's really so nice of you to come and really give me a real cheer up. And, and, you know, so kind, so, so compassionate of you. Pray, tell me, what have I done to deserve such a message? So, Isha ben Amat said, because you never had children. So Chizkiyahu said, many people never have children. You know I haven't had a children. I haven't had a child because, because, I've got Ruach HaKodesh, I can see to the future. I knew that if I would have a child, he's going to become the wicked, wicked king called, anyone know the name of the wicked king that his, he was going to have called Menashe. Menashe is the name. It was a wicked Jewish king called Menashe that created absolute terror. And he knew 
that that was going to be his child. So he wanted to prevent that child from coming into the world. It's a really interesting question, right? If you knew your child was going to be Adolf Hitler, is it better to not have a kid? You would say, logically, absolutely. You can save mankind. But actually, he said the prophet, listen to this, the prophet said, what you saw in the future is none of your business. Our business is to do what Hashem wants. And what does it say in the Torah? Procreate the world. Have children. By the way, after marriage. But have children. Have children. That's your business. It's not your business to make calculations with your spirituality. I see you on Instagram. Right? It's not, that's not your business. What are we learning from this? That we need to serve God, even at times we don't understand. Even, you know, if Verda's still there, you're still there, Verda. She's in Turkey. It's 12.30 at night. Why on earth do you listen to a rabbi on Zoom at 12.30 at night? But I hope you still are because this is your chance to learn Torah. So lama la, even if it's uncomfortable, it could be inconvenient, it could be illogical, it could be irrational. But if it's a mitzvah, yalla, we do it. Same idea as we said in our relationships with each other. We don't just are kind to each other when it suits us when it's easy, when it's rational. Men and women, trust me, we don't understand each other. Forget about it. Hashem wired us up very differently. Whatever we say, we're innately different. But that's the point. The point is to overcome those differences and still to give each other unconditional selfless love. And that's the way Hashem needs it for us. And I'll give you one more piece of Talmud to conclude. There's a piece of Talmud in Sanhedrin. We we'll finish with this. Page 100 in Sanhedrin. A, and it says like this, it says, yeah, Verda's still there. Well, round of applause for Turkey, who's with us at 12.30 at night. Awesome, Verda. You're getting such rewards. Super lucky. Says the Gemara, the following. Rabbi Yochanan was giving a class to his students. Not on Zoom, live. And he was giving the class. <laughs> and, and he said the following. He said, there's a, there's a tradition in Jewish thought the when Mashiach comes, he said this course is about really now building us towards Mashiach. So that's why it's about love. It's first and foremost, we need to love Hashem to get to Mashiach. He says, when Mashiach comes as Rabbi Yochanan, Hashem is going to bring down from the heavenly world diamonds to pave the gates of Jerusalem. And the diamonds will be the size of 30 Amas via 30 Amas, which means extremely big. You know, an Amar is like a huge foot. So you know, 30 feet times 30 feet, each diamond. It's impossible, right? Like, you've never seen anything like that. It would be implausible. By the way, what's really interesting is the stones at the Western Wall are much bigger than normal. You have to really try and understand how 2,000 years ago, and probably in the, in the first temple, close to 3,000 years ago, how they made stones that size. Very interesting. But anyway, we're taught that when Mashiach comes, it's going to be diamonds the size of 30 Amas, the size of 30 Amas. So one of the boys put up their hands and said, Rabbi, really? As we say in Tel Aviv, better met. Yeah, really? Come on. It's just a legend. It's not really true, is it? And Rabbi Echonen left it. He goes, no, that's, that's true. Somehow, you know, miracles will happen. There'll be much bigger miracles than that. That'll just be one of the miracles happening. Anyway, that summer, says the Talmud, the boy went on a rowing trip. And he looked up to the sky and Hashem showed him right now, those angels who are making those diamonds. Hashem so showed him this vision of, the, of, of what's going on in the spiritual world, where the, angel, the angels are working at those, those diamonds, making this, hewing these beautiful diamonds, 30 amas by 30 amas. And the boy was so excited. There was no WhatsApp. He couldn't take photos. He couldn't go and send a message to his teacher. So he was so excited to finally get back and to tell his teacher, Rabbi Othman, so he finally gets back, tells Rabbi Othman, you were right. I saw it with my own eyes. How do you think Rabbi Ophelman responded? Anyone give me a message back? How do you think Rabbi Ophelman responded? What do you reckon? He said, what do you, what, what do you think he said? Says the Talmud Rabbi Ophelman, didn't actually say a word. He looked at him. He looked to him. You see, Rabbi Ophelman was almost like a vessel of God. And he was, you know, Hashem does have this relationship to us where there's a lot of love. But there's also a lot of the time disappointment if we mess up. And that point, he really messed up. And his eyes looked at him, and I don't really understand this part of the Talmud. The Talmud says the boy died. 
the boy died. He just fell and died. And then the Talmud says the following. Why was it that at the time when Rabbi Yochan was explaining it, when the boy said, I don't believe you, he didn't get in trouble. But he only got in trouble when he said, I believe you. Makes no sense. We learn now why we have to drink Adzalo Yoda on Purim. We're meant to drink on Purim to that level. Till we are so in love with God that we don't need to rationalize our performance. We don't have to rationalize the mitzvot. It's not a rational system. It's way beyond that. It transcends that. When the boy said to Rabbi Yochanan, I only believe you because I saw it with my own eyes. As we say, seeing is believing. That's very good for science, but ain't very good for spirituality. The whole point of spirituality is there's going to be faith because we can't see God because God hides. That's the consequence of the sin of Adam and Eve. We're here to find, they hide and seek with God through his veil. On Purim, Hashem takes off the mask and you see Hashem. And now we're meant to reciprocate and say, I love you. And my relationship with you now transcends logic. Adelo Yoda. I'm no longer rationalizing my service to you. I, I'm, I'm of service unconditionally. That, my dear friends, is step number three of how you can fall in love in God. So I'll just finish off again just to conclude the three steps. How you fall in love with Hashem. Step one is us chatting, number two, gratitude, number three, unconditional love through Adzalo Yoda, doing it not through your rationale, doing it through your heart, doing it through being a servant, being, being of service. Let's just finish off and conclude with the words of Maimonides, because I've got to add this in, because his words of the laws of Shiva is one of the most famous pieces of Torah on the topic of loving God, because he articulates it in a way you wouldn't have thought. The Ramam generally is, is a big rationalist, right? You would never dream. It's actually Maimonides who writes this. If you want to check it out, it's in the Laws of Tshuva, chapter 10. And he writes the following. Number one, he says, don't do mitzvot. The 613 mitzvot. You know, some of you I'm talking about trying to help keep Shabbat and keep kosher. Don't do them out of guilt. Don't do them to get blessings. Don't do them because it suits you. Do them, he says. The only one who serves God in this man, they train, you should serve Hashem me'ahava, out of love. Just like if your spouse will ask you to do something that your craving of love, your desire, because you love them so much, like again, a, a mother to a newborn, the newborn, the mother has so much love for that newborn, you just are propelled to go and help. That's how we should be serving Hashem, out of love. And then he writes, one who serves Hashem out of love occupies himself in the Torah and the mitzvahs and walks on the path of wisdom because there's no ulterior motive. And that's the goal. And then he talks about Abraham, which is what tonight's about. And that's what it means. And that's why he calls Abraham, you're the one more than anyone ever who loved me. You know, James Bond, you've got the, you've got the film, The Spy Who Loved Me. So Maimonides says, Abraham was the one who loved me. Can you imagine being called, being loved Hashem? We managed to put on my father's tombstone and there's, there's a verse in Deuteronomy about Benjamin. His name is Benjamin. A Yedid Hashem. He was a friend of God. That's pretty cool, right? That's what Benjamin was called. We believe that about my dad. He was a friend of Hashem. So Abraham probably was even like, even a better compliment. Hashem said, the one that loved me. How wouldn't we? That's something to aspire for, no? That's something to, to really. And by the way, we have an opportunity to aspire to it every single day when Hashem asks us to say, in the Shema, we're meant to say, I love you, Hashem. By the way, just like in a relationship, you're meant to say, I love you. To your children, you're meant to say, I love you. To your parents, you're meant to say, I love you. To Hashem, you're meant to say, I love you. By the way, you can just say, I love you. Just start, start saying that. And by the way, sometimes you can fake it to make it. The more you say it, the more you start feeling it, explains your best love. Because your soul will start getting used to now how the body is acting. And then he writes the following, listen to this, number three. What is the proper degree of love? That a person should love Hashem with a very great and exceeding love until his soul is bound up in the love of Hashem, that he would always be obsessed with his love as if he is lovesick. Any of you been like lovesick? Any of you like have been so fallen in love that you can't like stand to be away from each other or, or maybe someone's like your loved one has had to depart for a while? 
and you're just feeling this pangs of emptiness, being lovesick. That's how the Ram, the Ramba, right? We are meant to be, we are meant to feel with Hashem. We're meant to be in love sick with Hashem. And then he quotes, a lovesick person's thoughts are never diverted from the love of that woman. He was always obsessed with her when he sits down, when he gets up, when he eats, when he drinks, with even a greater love than the love of God should be implanted in the hearts of those who love him. And he quotes King Solomon. King Solomon said, Ki oni. In Song of Songs, chapter two, verse five, listen to this amazing line from Solomon says, he says, Ki oni. I am ill in love with you. I am sick in love with you. I am literally love sick. King Solomon, the great King Solomon, the wisest man of all. He doesn't give us a scientific formula. His maybe greatest scientific formula is saying, Hashem, I'm in love. I'm so in love with you. I can't think of anything else. By the way, now we know why Kabbalists haven't got time for anything else in the world. They just want to be devoted to prayer and to Torah. Because they, when you get to like the big wide world and have to start working, it's hard when you have this amazing devotion and connection. So that's something to check out in your own time if you want. You look through the laws of Tshuva. Chapter, by the way, the whole book laws of Tshuva is unbelievable and relevant to all of you. At least chapter 10 will reiterate this. So 